everybody! Today we're going to talk about Flipper, a debugging platform for your mobile and any kind of other hardware. Over the last year, we've been working relentlessly trying to reimagine what Flipper is and what it can do. Um, Flipper is known to be um, an electron-based uh, debugging companion that you start on your laptop, you connect your mobile phone or something else, and it just fetches some data from your mobile phone for you. Um, and what we envision Flipper to become, um, we want it to be a crucial part of your CI infrastructure. We want it to be a universal device bridge for any kind of hardware that you could use, potentially. But before we get started, um, let me say a few words about myself. My name is Andre. Uh, I currently live in London. I work uh, at Meta maintaining Flipper full time. And our plan for the day is to cover what Flipper is, um, talk about how we're enabling programmatic access to Flipper, also known as headless mode, and how you can benefit from it. And last but not least, um, how we use the new headless Flipper at Meta. And uh, without further ado, Flipper is um, Flipper is a platform for debugging iOS, Android, and React Native apps. Visualize, inspect, blah blah blah. This is clearly a joke. Hopefully, hopefully, some of you had a good laugh. Um, so yeah, Flipper is basically Chrome Dev Tools for your mobile device and any kind of other hardware. Yeah. Um, this is Flipper doing some layout inspection of some arbitrary mobile application. This is also Flipper um, inspecting network requests going somewhere, in this case, in PMJS. Uh, and this is also Flipper uh, fetching the logs from the device. And this is also Flipper. This is our not so secret uh, testing plugin, um, which basically just plays a game of tic-tac-toe. So in other words, um, a Flipper is just a device discovery service with um, a message bus. And Flipper wouldn't be Flipper without its plugins, which are the most important part of Flipper. And at this point, let's, let's take a look at how it all works, really. Say we have Flipper and some mobile phones, one, two, three. Flipper starts ADB for Android, IDB for iOS, or Metro for React Native to discover all these devices. Um, and once it discovers them, it displays them in some hopefully nice, <laughs> I hope you like it, UI. Um, for clarity, let's name them ABC on the left, ABC on the right. Hopefully left and right still in the same place for you. Ah, whatever. So yeah, we have all these devices. Um, and once Flipper discovers all the devices, it can start uh, the plugins on user's demand. And the best part is that um, it can be the same desktop plugin, desktop part of the plugin, the part that you see in the UI, but it could be potentially, uh, well, potentially hundreds and even dozens of different hardware devices, but currently we support Android, iOS, React Native, C++, and JavaScript, meaning Node.js or web. So in this case, let's imagine that we have Android, iOS, and React Native devices. And all of them could use the same UI part in Flipper. And Flipper ships quite a few plugins out of the box uh, in open source. Have I mentioned that Flipper open source? Yeah, Flipper is open source and lots of Flipper plugins are open source. For instance, the Lox plugins that we saw before that fetches the logs from the device, or CPU utilization plugin, 
and you can see the links um, on the screen and also later you'll be able to get the slides and go to these links if you want to examine the code of these plugins and um, I mentioned the support of various um, operating systems and even platforms, hardware platforms and purpose. Uh, the best part of Flipper is that um, the most complex part of the plugin is usually the UI part of the plugin. It usually has the most logic and the device part of the plugin is usually fairly primitive. For instance, let's take a look at our navigation plugin that kind of commands the device to go to a certain screen. And this is, well, without all the boilerplate, this is in essence the implementation for our navigation plugin for iOS. As you can see, it's pretty straightforward. Myself, I'm not an iOS developer, uh, but with a certain degree of confidence, I can read what happens here. Uh, well, basically, we receive a message from Flipper, uh, and then we tell uh, the device to go somewhere. But that's only half of the story. Flipper also starts a WebSocket server that accepts connections from the applications on the devices. And, uh, well, we can see here that, say we start different Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp applications on our devices, and then we display these applications ni nicely in the UI. And when Flipper discovers these applications, when they connect to this WebSocket server, Flipper creates a message bus between the UI part of the plugin and the device part of the plugin. Um, and once this message bus is created, the devices are discovered. Um, Flipper also can start custom plugins for every application on demand. And we can see that each plugin once again has two different parts. One part lives in the UI and it's usually the most complex part. Another part lives on the device, well, in fact, inside of the app itself, and it just kind of syncs the data from the device or from the application to the desktop part to display it nicely in the UI, or maybe to interpret some commands and to do something on Flipper's demand. And once these applications start once the plugins start, uh, once the message bus starts, these plugins can start exchanging messages, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Flipper doesn't impose any restrictions on what plugins can do. Well, we probably, we probably have some, but we try to keep the restrictions um, very, very small. We try to keep them to a certain some minimum. So you can use this message bus in any way you want. And this is where you can let your imagination run free and wild. Sky is the limit here. For instance, um, you can use this um, message bus to peek into the application state. And if this, con if this conference was live, if I was live on stage, probably at this point, I would ask you to raise your hand if you um, ever debugged your application using console log. Here I am, I'm a big fan of console log, but what if you, ha what if you could have a live representation of your state right on your desktop, uh, right, uh, right in Flipper, in the UI, updating live, and you no longer need console log to dump the state of your application somewhere. It's there for you. And it's totally customized for your, um, say, React Native application. You can expect uh, the application layout or tell your application to go to a specific screen, just like uh, what we saw in the navigation plugin. You can simulate hardware signals. For instance, I have this um, wristband with me. Um, it's not developed by Meta, it's some, I think it's Xiaomi, but it doesn't really matter. 
say you develop a new wristband and the hardware is still in prototype but you already negotiated the protocol you know what messages are going to be there and you want your developers to start developing um start creating an android application for instance um with flipper you could simulate hardware signals arriving into your application and therefore you could unlock unblock your mobile developers um, and let them create the application without depending on the real piece of hardware. How cool is it? Um, you can also command your device or your application to do pretty much anything. Um, don't let my limited fantasy set the borders for you here. Whew. On to the next part, how Flipper changes and why we're moving away from the Electron monolith. Let's review Flipper's architecture. Um, basically, we have two, two, yeah, so many fingers, two different parts. We have Flipper state, where we do device discovery, where we create this message bus, start the WebSocket server, and we have the UI. Flipper UI. And for a long, long time, it's been an Electron monolith, meaning that we had Node.js process, Node.js part, doing this device discovery um, and message bus uh, business. And we had a web view with um, our React application displaying the UI. And we also had some Electron magic that allowed them to communicate somehow. And this setup worked quite nicely for a long, long time, but it kind of fails to provide um, necessary utilities in certain scenarios. For instance, imagine that you run your simulator not locally on your laptop, but somewhere far away, somewhere there in the cloud. How would you connect Flipper to your simulator then? Um, well, one of the ideas that you could tunnel your ports from your IDB, ADB, whatever, using SSH or something like that. Yeah, that could work. And uh, that's actually what we've been doing for uh, quite a while. So yeah, it totally works in real world. But then what if you don't really want to develop using your laptop, at least not directly. What if you want to have some sort of remote development, remote, remote developer environment somewhere in the same or different cloud? What if you want to exchange laptops, or maybe jump from a laptop to your desktop or for any other reason, maybe just maybe your, your repo is so huge, you don't want you don't really want to check it out every time. You want to have it checked out for you somewhere in the cloud and you just want to connect to your cloud machine. How would you use Flipper then? Specifically, um, how would you kind of relay Flipper UI to your laptop? Uh, well, yeah, there's a way. RDP, I'm looking at you. But um, this is actually would be a moment for me to ask Yet another question to the audience. How many of you like using RDP? Um, yeah, probably, probably there wouldn't be too many hands. For instance, uh, maybe I'm just lazy to figure it out properly, but I've never been a huge fan of RDP. It's always been laggy for me for some reason. So, and I think that lots of people share my, uh, my feeling here. But this is not even the end, uh, the end of our problems. What if you want to automate something? What if you want another program to interact with Flipper? Then how would you, how would you uh, force your script, your program to talk to Flipper? How would Flipper um, understand these commands and how would Flipper talk to the device in the end? 
yes, some parts of this chain, they're solved. For instance, Flipper talking to the cloud, but the other parts are not. And to solve this, over the last year, we've been trying to um, split Flipper kind of in half. We've been trying to create a separate Flipper UI, which can be hosted independently and at least run independently. And flip a server that would contain that stateful part with server, with device discovery, with the message bus, and etc. and etc. And this setup where we have Flipper UI independent of Flipper server uh, could potentially solve all these scenarios. We could run Flipper UI uh, on the script side and then it could talk somehow to Flipper server. We'll, co we'll cover how exactly later. Um, the same setup also works quite nicely in the remote developer environment setup. Um, we could run Flipper UI uh, on our developer's laptop and then it would connect to the remote machine and uh, talk to Flipper server there. Um, and also this way we could potentially integrate Flipper UI in any kind of application that supports web uh, using our favorite iframes. Yay! Um, so the current setup looks like this. We have a dedicated Node.js server, which does the device discovery, does, does this message bus business. And we have Flipper UI, which is now a React, a standalone React application, which runs in our browsers, and they can talk via WebSockets. And you could notice that um, the previous setup, it didn't quite solve all of the problems. It was kind of kind of weird that we integrated Flipper UI with our script, right? I mean, do we do we expect our script to push the buttons in the UI? Um, absolutely not. That's where the API part comes into play. Um, let's review again our high-level Flipper architecture. So once again, we have Flipper server, which is Node.js process, doing device discovery, message bus. We have mobile applications and we have Flipper UI, which is a React application running in a browser. And you could notice that um, the desktop part of the plugin, it's displayed inside of that UI. And that's not a mistake. It's done on purpose. For historical reasons, we've been hosting a plugin state inside of the UI. So I didn't say that our UI has more state than our Flipper server. And that's a huge problem because now when we introduce headless clients, when we introduce APIs, it means that our headless clients have to somehow run these plugins and maintain their state. Potentially, we could recreate all this logic um, in different languages, but then how would we run plugins? We could, um, well, maybe we could start spin up different JavaScript machines, somehow do some sort of IPC mumbo jumbo to talk to this uh, JavaScript-based plugins from some other languages. Whew. Yeah, my head is spinning just from describing this setup. Alternatively, we could make our, we could force all of our headless clients to be Node.js processes. Then they would be able to use the same code that we use in our React applications. But the problem here is with Node.js. Um, that would put a severe restriction on how Flipper clients could be implemented. After all, not everyone loves JavaScript. Alternatively, we could host plugins on Flipper server. Um, the idea here is that most of the modern plugins 
well actually all of the modern plugins. They are split in two parts, logic and view. And this logic part of the plugin, it exposes some sort of API. And usually this API is asynchronous. And usually, once again, usually, um, parameters and the result of these API calls, they are serializable. Do you see where I'm going? Yeah, RPC. So what we did is we created so-called Flipper Server Companion that could that shares the code uh, between itself and our Flipper UI, the code that manages the plugins and runs the plugins. And now that Flipper Server Companion, um, it exposes an RPC-like interface or web sockets to our headless clients and runs the plugins, allowing these headless clients to send commands over this RPC uh, to the plugins hosted on Flipper server side. Uh, don't worry, we'll take a closer look at this in a bit. Um, let's get back to our Flipper Tic-Tac-Toe plugin, which might be a perfect example um, of decapitating um, one of Flipper plugins that used to run solely in the UI. Um, by the way, this plugin is also open source and you can see the link uh, on the bottom of your screen. Um, and let's go over the source code of this plugin. So this part is our logic part where we um, create the state of this plugin. There will be a three-dimensional grid to display on the screen. And we, dis we create, we expose some API calls, send update, make move, reset. We do some magic when the plugin connects and we return back the API calls. Let's go over each one of these API calls individually. For instance, this make move call. What it does, it just verifies that this is the right player, blah, 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 blah. Essentially, what it does, it computes the next state of the plugin and sends this state to the device. So whenever player in the UI clicks on the button making a move, a new state is going to be calculated and sent over the wire. Send update, as simple as that, just get the state, serialize it under the hood and send this data over to the mobile device. And on connect magic, what happens here is that we create a bunch of uh, message handlers. So whenever we receive a next move message from the device, we make this move calculating the state. Um, whenever we receive uh, a get state message, uh, we just send the state to the device. And initially when the plugin connects, when the device connects, we send the initial state to the device. The view part is pretty straightforward. Um, we just kind of input this API using use plugin hook. And then uh, we just iterate over the existing cells to create this two dimensional grid to display our buttons to click. And the new part here is this API function, which kind of white lists the API calls that we are allowed to use in headless context. Um, you remember that I said that not, of, not all of the API calls could be serialized, only the asynchronous ones, right? So yes, this function is intended for this very purpose uh, to kind of blacklist the calls that cannot be used in headless context and maybe do something extra. Maybe you want to expose some sort of a different API or the wire, who knows? We just wanted to give plugin developers as much freedom as possible. And in the end, this is what happens. Um, when a headless client tries to use the API, 
Um, on the client side, um, it might look like just making a call if it's JavaScript or any other language. But what happens under the hood is that we send a message, a JSON or WebSockets. Um, and we are telling our Flipper server companion that this is plugin execute command and uh, this message has some sort of an ID, therefore it expects a response and the data is the data part of this JSON contains what API call should be called and uh, the arguments for this API call. And whenever this API call executes on the Flipper server side, somewhere there, um, the response is once again serialized and sent back with the same ID and with the data with, uh, from the API call. Whew. Demo time. Um, well, I have a confession. I'm not that cool to do real life coding. So I pre-recorded some, um, pre-recorded a video for you. And in this video, um, I'm playing the game of tic-tac-toe using my UI, clicking some buttons, playing tic-tac-toe from my mobile phone um, with the desktop counterpart of the plugin. And now I'm doing the same very thing using our headless client playing tic-tac-toe in my terminal. Yay, making some moves. There you go, there you go. Who is going to win? Me or me? Yeah, I like winning. Yay, I won, woo! Um, the source code for this demo is going to be available uh, on GitHub and you're going to see a link later. So don't worry about that. If you're interested uh, in playing with that, you'll be able to do so. Going back to our slides, I promised you to cover how we're using Flipper at Meta, right? So far for headless Flipper, we have two scenarios. We're working on future, on next integrations, but so far we have two integrations working. Um, the first one is our design verification procedure when our designers create their uh, amazing, mind-blowing design. We do, well, we do what we can to implement it to the best of our abilities. And well, luckily for us, we have a design verification procedure when we submit a screenshot and our designers can go back and verify that our implementation matches uh, the intent. And currently, this is what happens. Um, developer can type um, a command in their terminal asking Flipper to take a screenshot on the device and to submit it to the cloud. So when a developer types this command, um, the CLI client sends a WebSocket message to Flipper Server Companion and starts our uh, UI validation plugin. This plugin connects to the device and prompts the device to take a screenshot. Then this screenshot is transferred back to the device. Well, not to the device, to Flipper plugin. And then this screenshot is uploaded to the cloud. But from the developer's perspective, it looks like a single terminal command. Ooh, how cool is that? And the next one, in my view, um, is even cooler. We were exploring how we could integrate Flipper with our end-to-end -end tests. Say we have the following setup. Um, we have a terminal from which a developer can start an end-to-end an -end test suite. We have a web browser when this developer can see the result of the test suite execution. We have Jest running somewhere there in the cloud. 
Well, alternatively, it can run on developer's laptop, but who cares? Let's imagine that it can, now it runs in the cloud. And in a totally different cloud, we have, well, this was just cloud, so this cloud is going to be device cloud, uh, where we have all the simulators and just runs some testing magic there. And at first, as the first stage, we've decided to allow developers to debug their end-to-end -end test suites with Flipper. Because say you have a very long test suite that does like a crazy amount of actions doing something on the device, but then something goes wrong. How do you really debug it? Uh, do you watch a video? Do you try to imagine what happens there? What if you could have Flipper with Flipper server living next to your emulators in the cloud? And then you could see Flipper UI right in your browser inspecting the data from your simulator. But let's not even stop there. Say you have data from your Flipper server in just end-to-end -end test suites. Could you run any assertions on, this, on the state of the application? Do you remember that we have like dozens and even hundreds of plugins, of custom plugins for lots of applications that fetch uh, some custom state from the application? Uh, well, what if you could do snapshot testing with Flipper? Or what if you could do Flipper dumps and make Flipper uh, save a lot of debugging information during your end-to-end -end test runs and then examine this information later. How cool would that be? Um, that's something that is not implemented really right now at Meta, but if you decide to give it a try, give us a shout on Twitter. We would love to hear your story. Whew, this is almost the end. As promised, uh, links to the headless demo and the headless tic-tac-toe client. Feel free to add us on Twitter and on GitHub. And feel free to reach out to me with any questions, once again on Twitter or on GitHub. Um, this is legal stuff, so we don't get sued. Um, referencing the images that I used. The QR code leads to this slide deck for future references. It was a pleasure to meet you all. Thank you. And let's make the developer experience better together. Woo!